Our next presentation is entitled Examining the Cross-Linguistic Relations Between Early Reading and Writing for Simultaneous Bilingual Children in English and their Mother Tongue Language. Our presenters are from the Center of Research on Child Development at the NIE NTU campus. First up is Dr. O'Brien, is a senior research scientist at the National Institute of Education, Singapore. She heads the, the bilingual and biliteracy development area within the Center for Research in Child Development. A cognitive psychologist by training, Dr. O'Brien's research focus is on reading development from a cognitive neuroscience perspective. In particular, how different types of learners, bilingual, learning disabled or at risk, interact with different educational environments, environments and experiences. She has conducted research on developmental dyslexia with multi-componential and technology-based interventions, as well as on the typical development of reading, reading fluency, and biliteracy. Second presenter is Dr. Nicole Lim. She's a research fellow from the National Institute of Education in Singapore. After receiving her BA in Psychology and Sociology from University of Buffalo, she pursued her MA in Psychology at New York University and thereafter completed her PhD in Psychology at Georgia State University. Her interests largely involve language development, reading and learning disabilities. Her dissertation explored the cognitive and linguistic underpinnings of mathematical skills in children with leading reading disabilities. The third speaker is Ms. Noor Atika, who is a research assistant from the National Institute of Education. Prior to receiving her BA in Psychology, Politics and International Relations from the University of Melbourne, she was working under the speech and drama industry and has years of experience working with children. She has great interest in bilingual language development, home environment and social emotional development in young children. Her work explores bilingualism, spelling, and the role of home language environment and has, which has on children's language development. We invite Dr. Dr. Wolfrey. Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, to DAS for inviting us today to speak. Um, it's a little difficult following up that last talk, I must say. We thought we were being pretty clever and creative, and we have some activities too, but they're nothing like what we just did. So anyway, trying to keep you awake in the afternoon. I know this is the last talk of the day, and what we plan to do is to present some of our research, um, which as mentioned in our title, has to do with early reading and writing skills in a group of uh, bilingual children here in Singapore. So we're looking at different uh, types of languages that children are learning simultaneously, um, and we're looking across the kindergarten years into early primary, first year of primary school. So we'll intersperse some of our findings with some activities as we mentioned, um, and then we're going to kind of switch off as a team here. Um, so I'm going to let Nicole start off. Okay. Hey everyone, I'm Nicole. How are you doing? Okay. Okay, so since it's the end of the day, we're actually going to start off with a little bit of activities. Again, not as spontaneous as yours, but it's still pretty fun, okay? So um, for this activity, it's a very simple one. You're just going to start off by answering what is literacy. So to participate in this activity, you just need to use your smartphones and scan the QR code over there, or you can type in the link, and then we'll have a d quick discussion of what is literacy and what does literacy mean to you. Yeah, so some of you all have actually already answered. Thank you so much for participation. Any more answers? We have 13 people, 14 right now. 15, pretty cool. <laughs> okay. Anybody else want to participate? Okay. Okay, should we just have a discussion? Okay, so what are some common answers that we see out there? What is literacy? Okay, you can read it too. Okay, reading, writing, spelling, okay? Understanding of print, 
ability to read and comprehend reading and spelling. So a lot of you have said reading and writing, right? So there's a general consensus. When we talk about literacy, a very simple definition that comes to mind is having the ability to read and write, okay? So to, be read and, to read and write, right? What are some skills that are essential for reading and writing? Can we just have a, like, shout it out, shout out answers? What, why, what skills do we need to possess to be able to read? For example, sorry, letter sounds. Okay, okay, exactly. Some more? Very good. Thank you. One more then. Understanding print, right? Okay. So all these different skills can actually be known as literacy skill. Understanding the relationship between print and sound could be alphabetic knowledge. Understanding what sounds are of the language that is phonological skills, and all these are actually key to literacy skills. Okay. So this is just example of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about all of these different skills and what, what brings about literacy, okay? So I hope the activity was fun. Was it? Just say yes. It makes me feel better, okay? Just, yeah, we can just dance along. Okay. Uh, if you want, okay. Uh, we need the screen again. Where is she? Oh, the lady needs to bring up the screen. Okay, so, okay. Okay. All right, well, we'll pick up from there. <laughs> Thank you for participating. So as Nicole mentioned, we see most of the answers have to do with print, reading, writing. Um, I think these days we see a lot of, I don't know if any of you have experienced this, but a lot of people are using the word literacy in many different subject areas. In my children's school, they renamed their physical education class as physical literacy. So I don't really know what that means, but we're gonna talk about the traditional sense of literacy that I think we all would agree on here. It has to do mainly with reading and writing. And reading and writing themselves are pretty complex skills that involve um, a lot of different sub-skills or component skills people talk about. Um, so a couple of, we'll talk a little bit about theory here, but uh, some of the theories agree that um, some of the main components of reading and writing are similar to each other. So reading and writing, while they're different processes, they share a lot of kind of underlying skills or underlying composite skills that are required to, uh, to, to do them. So for example, being able to decode um, or, or transcode uh, speech into print when you are um, trying to write something, when you're spelling. Uh, likewise, when you're trying to transcribe print into, into oral language when you're trying to decode, when you're reading. So these two points of um, both reading and writing are, are similar processes, but in some cases, the opposite um, to each other. Um, in addition, we know that the purpose of reading and also of writing, someone wrote communication. So being able to understand what you're reading is a big component of reading as well. And being able to express or communicate your ideas with, with writing requires other skills related to composition. So we have comprehension and composition types of skills that are also part of these basic models of what are the foundational skills that we need for reading and writing and learning to read and write. In addition to these, there's other components or shared knowledge between reading and writing. And from the research, we know that there's things like um, having some understanding of the basic structure of language. So whether it's the sound structure of language, uh, phonological awareness, or the meaning structure of language, morphological awareness, all of these metalinguistic skills are quite important for both reading and writing. Um, as well, oral language is also very important, so having an understanding about um, the meanings of words, um, vocabulary, as well as the syntactic structure of sentences. So oral language, metalinguistic language, um, are some of the linguistic uh, skills that the children would need and rely on when they're learning to read or to write. Um, and again, these are considered as foundational skills to reading and writing. Okay, so we're going to do another activity, and this time Martika is going to lead us through. Hi, everyone. So I'll just be very honest. This is supposed to be an online activity. Unfortunately, um, things didn't work out. So uh, can everyone stand up for me? Let's do a little activity. Uh, no dancing, definitely. <laughs> okay, so uh, now I'd like you to try as fast as possible to get into groups of eight and as fast as possible in within the group of eight, find 10 items that are blue. Okay, ready, set, go. 
And the first team, raise up your hand and sit down. Wait for me there. All right, time is ticking. Oh, wait, first team. Okay, let me check. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nine, Nine. Close, ten. ten. Okay, we got the first team here. Second team. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, more than ten. Great. And then the third team. Okay. Okay, where? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, good. Okay, stay where you are. Stay, stay, stay. All right. Okay. <laughs> now, the first question we have is, which methods do you think are effective in teaching literacy? We have phonics, sight words, word families, inferential learning, and others. Now, I'll give you maybe 30 seconds to discuss with each other, and then once time is up, you just raise up your hand, okay? Three, two, one, go. No, 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 no. Uh, and if you have other methods, it's fine. Just, I am pretty sure that we have a few uh, educators here, right? Uh, okay, uh, time's up in 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Okay, anyone has any suggestions? Okay, yeah. Okay, who picks phonics? Can you raise up your hand? Okay. Uh, maybe uh, raise up and stay there. Nicole, can you help me count? <laughs> oh, oh, suddenly there's so many, Nicole. <laughs> 25, okay. Okay, then how about sight words? How many of you think sight words is important? Okay, 39. Um, what, fa uh, wait. Uh, what families? Inferential learning. Oh, much less than that. Okay. And others, anyone have any other suggestions on other types of Yeah? All of the above, okay. Ah, okay, all of the above. <laughs> okay, almost everyone here. Okay, great. Okay. Um, okay, actually our next question is, now you say, okay, these are the kind of methods you, you think is good to use in classrooms, great for literacy, but the real question is, which of these methods do you actually use in your classrooms? You, we know beliefs and what happens in the classroom is very different. So, just a quick show of hands, okay? Who voted for phonics but you find it very difficult to actually incorporate it in your classrooms? Just a quick show of hands. Okay, phonics maybe. Okay, how about sight words? Maybe a little bit difficult, I see a few hands. Word families? 
inferential learning. Okay, one, two, okay, three, four, oh, more, more, oh, it's growing. Okay, and others, any others? No, okay, as we can see here, inferential learning seems to be a little bit harder to incorporate in classrooms. Okay, now, um, before I end off this, let's play the last one, okay? Okay, um, in your groups, find uh, 11 things that are pink in colour. Three, two, one, go! We got the first team here, second team. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, great. Okay, last one. Oh, this is nice. Okay, one, two. Oh, a lot of ladies here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, great. Okay, everyone, please take a seat. Okay, thank you, everybody, for your patience. Um, <laughs> So hopefully you're still awake after that. Um, I think what we, what we were trying to emphasize from this little activity, well, the, the middle one at least, not so much finding pink things, but um, just to get a, uh, an idea of what are the variety of um, beliefs or opinions or practices that people use in terms of teaching literacy. Um, so we see that, I think maybe people voted twice, right? On some of these. <laughs> I think there are a number of people that said all of the above are important. So. Um, and that's probably true, but in terms of incorporating that into your lessons, that might be difficult to integrate everything. So I think what we would like to uh, just point out is that this raises some basic questions about um, teaching, uh, teaching literacy. So a lot of questions that we have when we talk to people who, who do uh, policy or curriculum planning are things like um, there's a belief that oracy should precede literacy, or in some cases that we shouldn't be teaching children to write and copy things until they learn to read, so reading should precede writing. Um, so these are all some, some beliefs that, that actually go into practice in some cases, and we're, what we're wondering is whether all of these are sound practices. I don't know that we have a firm, uh, we don't have a firm uh, answer to it, and I don't know if anyone else in, has done research to confirm which is better than the other or what approach is best. Um, but we'll, what we do want to do is to um, provide some information based on children's performance to see whether um, we can give some insights into how this, what implications this would have for the way that we teach literacy skills. So should we teach, uh, should we indeed teach reading before writing or should we teach things in a more integrated way? Um, because when children develop literacy skills, they tend to develop them together. And we'll see a little bit of that in the, in the uh, data that we'll show you. Um, so this is particularly important in, um, uh, in contexts like in Singapore where children are learning to read in more than one language at the same time. So in Singapore, for those of you not familiar, um, children are learning to read in English, but at the same time they're also being introduced to literacy skills in an additional language which is referred to as their mother tongue language. Oftentimes it's a, a second language. Um, it might be sp spoken in the home, but it's also something that they might be picking up in addition to English. Um, and so these are really complex questions in terms of how do we best introduce all of these different scripts and the different um, skills of reading and writing. How should we best teach these things? Um, so what I want to do next is just to show you um, some of the results that we had from a research study. Um, and we presented some of this uh, data at a previous con conference in India. Um, but what we wanted to highlight is um, a couple of things. First of all, we wanted to look at more deeply that first question that we asked all of you about what is literacy. So we all have ideas about what literacy is, but when we, at, when we look at children's performance, what does that tell us about what kind of uh, 
component skills make up literacy for children. Um, in particular, we're looking here at children who are what we would consider simultaneous bilinguals because they're learning to read and write in English and another language at the same time. Um, and then the second question that we want to address is what is this relationship between reading and writing or spelling, uh, particularly during this early acquisition period? Um, so what we, um, what we did was to uh, collect some data. This is from part of a longer uh, longitudinal cohort study um, undertaken in NIE. It's called the uh, Singapore Canute Garden Impact Project, so it's a larger study. And we looked at some children within this study who um, were given both uh, assessments in English literacy plus another language literacy, their mother tongue uh, language. And so this uh, sample consisted of children um, who were either English Chinese learners, English Malay learners, or English Tamil learners. And we followed them from kindergarten one to kindergarten two to primary one. And just to give you an idea of what these children look like in terms of their uh, bilingual status. This is the age of acquisition that their parents reported which language did they start to use or, or uh, speak in first. And zero is kind of in the middle here. So this is the relative difference in um, when they learn to speak in English or use English versus the mother tongue. So zero indicates they learned at the same time. So most of the children are learning both languages at the same time. And this uh, upper graph just shows, also from parent report, what languages are spoken in the home. And so this is also kind of a, a relative um, index. So uh, what's the relative use of English versus the mother tongue language at home? So again, zero would mean that they're both used equally at, uh, as much. And one would indicate that they're just using English, or negative one, that they're just using mother tongue exclusively at home. So as you can see, most of the children, even though there's a spread, most of the children are being exposed to more than one language in the home. So we do uh, refer to them as bilinguals and simultaneous biliteracy learners. Um, okay. And then these are the measures that we use to assess some of these uh, skills related to literacy, so we have both English measures, some standardized types of tests that we use for reading and spelling. I should say spelling, not selling. We misspelled spelling. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, we also uh, assess their phonological awareness. And then for either Chinese, Malay, or Tamil, whichever uh, language they're taking in school in addition to English, we also assess their reading and spelling. For this, we use some tasks that we developed, our research team developed tasks that are in the same format as the wide range achievement test. Um, and then we also assess their morphological awareness for these languages. Um, and in addition, we, um, we assess their receptive vocabulary using um, local, also locally developed tasks from NUS that are similar to the PPVT in format. Um, so these are the measures that we're looking at here. And what we did was we um, ran some uh, structural equation modeling, some statistical models to find out if we want to see what, which of these skills kind of gel together or contribute to our notion of what literacy is or the construct of literacy. Um, we looked at each of these language groups for English first. So this is all of their scores from the English tests that we gave them. And this is for the English Chinese group, the English Malay group, and the English Tamil group of children. Um, and what we see is that for all of them, uh, reading and spelling and phonological awareness contributed to this construct of literacy. Um, what we didn't see here for English was that vocabulary didn't contribute to literacy in this case. What we also see are these numbers are um, kind of like a weighting or um, how much each of these sets of scores contributes to the construct of literacy. So this range is between zero and one, and the closer it is to one, that means the more uh, variance, the more um, the more this score can explain literacy for the, that child. And so what we see from these relative ratings across reading, spelling, and phonological awareness is that there are similar patterns across all three groups. So reading and spelling contribute the most for each group and, and somewhat equally or um, almost equally. And then phonological awareness contributes a little bit less to literacy for all three groups. Okay, so again, this is for their English uh, literacy construct. Um, we did the same thing with the children's other languages. So again, we ran structural equation models. And this is for Chinese language, Malay language, and Tamil language. And here, again, we see a similarity across these three language groups 
in that both reading and spelling, um, morphological awareness, and in this case also vocabulary are contributing to the co construct of literacy across all three groups. We also see that there's a difference in terms of the weighting of these different components of literacy. So for both Chinese and Tamil, we see that spelling and reading are relatively similar in terms of how much they contribute to literacy. Um, and for uh, Chinese, morphological awareness has just as much weight or contributes just as much to literacy as do the reading and spelling scores. For Tamil, we see that um, morphological awareness and vocabulary contribute equally to the construct of literacy. Uh, Malay is interesting. We, we see here that spelling is the biggest contributor along with vocabulary, and reading has actually a lower contribution to literacy, which was a little surprising to us, but may have something to do with how consistent uh, or easy it is to decode um, letters in, and words in Malay. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more at the end of the talk. Um, but th these are some of the ideas that we have for why we're seeing these differences. Okay. Uh, so in summary for that first research question, we saw that vocabulary along with morphological awareness plus reading and spelling contributed to literacy in the mother tongue languages, whereas for English, phonological awareness along with reading and spelling contributed to English liter literacy. So um, before we go to the second research question, we're going to do another activity. Okay. Uh, do you want to explain the instruction? Okay. Um, while Nicole is passing the envelopes, uh, oh no. Unfortunately, we did not expect such a large group. So can all of you just gather to one of the four uh, tables here? Thank you. And then I'll explain what to do. Um, oh, yeah. Can I have a show of hands of how many Tamil speakers we have here? Yeah. One, two, three, four. Oh, can you guys uh, separate yourself into the four tables? Because our Tamil speaker is not here today. <laughs> One of our presenters was yeah. sick today. Uh, Malika wasn't able to present with us today, and she's our, Tam our Tamil expert. So we might need your help. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. We'll you can read it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe you move here. Mm. Okay, can. Okay, while you guys are moving around, I will explain the task. So what we have here, you can open the envelope up and place uh, it out. So as fast as possible, try to sort out the sentence. For this one, we separate it out into words. So the English sentence would be, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And you can refer here for Malay at the top, Tamil at the bottom, and Chinese uh, in the bottom. Oh no, this one is for them to sort out. As fast as they can. Part versus the second part. What was involved in doing the first part versus the second part? Submit. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So the first part, you really had to. It, it, I think it, maybe maybe the table that did it really quickly. Can you tell us what might have helped, or how did you do it so quickly? Were, were there people at your table that knew each language? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so maybe that helped, right? Knowing the language, so we, did, we gave you the answers, right? But I think knowing the language might have helped you to understand quickly how do you put the words into the right word order. So word uh, order, word syntax is important. The second part was a little more challenging because you had to know something not just about word order and sentences, but what other information helps you. Vocabulary and spelling. So knowing what the word might be, <laughs> what the word's trying to refer to, and how it might be spelled, right? So knowing that um, whatever form it was, with maybe the D at the beginning is missing, okay. um, that you could, still just, you could still figure out what that word is and maybe figure out that's a noun or a verb and that helps you to place it in the sentence. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about um, these things at, as we go along, but... The next thing that we wanted to do is really to look more at the relationship between reading and spelling. Um, and so here, this question is um, something that people have looked at in the literature, mainly within English and some other alphabetic languages. 
Um, so Uta Frith's uh, model, she's developed some uh, developmental models about these two types of skills and how they develop over time. And her idea was that um, the relationship between reading and writing is not, uh, they don't develop consistently, instead there's a dynamic relationship between them over development. So in her um, model, she would suggest that, at least for English, uh, reading leads spelling, that you, you develop your reading skills sooner and then you pick up your spelling skills afterwards. And there's a number of um, longitudinal studies that either support or don't support that. Some say that uh, these skills uh, progress together. Some say that they progress at different rates. Um, so what we really wanted to do was see within our sample for children learning multiple languages, what, do, what is the relationship between these two sets of skills, right, uh, reading and writing or spelling. So we're going to have Nicole kind of walk you through some of our statistical models again for the data that we have. And this is looking at children's, both their reading and spelling across kindergarten one, kindergarten two, and primary one. Hey, it's me again, Nicole. Okay, so right now we're going to talk about some of the analysis that we've done that actually explored the relation, longitudinal relationship between reading and spelling in English and three mother tongue languages, okay? So before we start, we're just going to give you an overview of what cross-like analysis is. So when you conduct analysis of cross-like analysis, you actually get some information about the cross-correlation uh, coefficients. So these are actually indicated in purple over there. And in co um, correlation coefficients, we actually see the relationship in one construct at one single time point. Okay, for instance, what is the relationship between K1 reading to K1 spelling, and what is the relationship between K2 reading and K2 spelling? Okay, got it? Okay, so in cor uh, correlation coefficients, the magnitude actually ranges between negative one to positive one, and obviously a larger magnitude would mean there's a larger effect. So the highlight of a cross-like analysis is actually the cross-like effects, okay? And this I actually indicated over here in blue and over here in red, okay? So in this cross-like effect actually describes one's construct's influence on another construct. So it does tell you the magnitude, how strong it is. It also tells you the direction of influence. Again, for instance, what is the effect of K1 reading on K2 spelling in blue? And what is the effect of K1 spelling onto K2 reading? Okay, or if there's a bi-directional influence, that also tells you that. Okay, so now we're gonna go through all the analysis that we've done, beginning with the relationship between English reading and English spelling. And as you can see from the magnitude, there is actually a strong relationship between reading and spelling early on at K1. And then this relationship actually reduces in strength and stay constant from K2 to P1. Again, looking at the numbers, this is 0.75, going down to 0.42, and then remaining constant at 0.42 at P1, okay? From the cross-like coefficients, we can actually see that there is an early influence of reading onto later spelling. Again, you can see from the numbers in red, those are actually high in magnitude, leading from K1 English reading to K2 English spelling versus um, K1 English spelling to K2 English reading. That magnitude is smaller. So over here we can see that reading actually has a stronger influence on later spelling rather than the other way around, okay? So now we're gonna move on to talk about the relationship between reading and spelling with Chinese children. And from the cross site coefficients, we can see that the relationship between reading and spelling actually diminishes over time. And from the cross-like effects, the, we actually see that the earlier reading skills actually seem to have a larger impact on later spelling, while early spelling seems to have a limited influence on later reading. Now for Tamil language. The, cor the correlation coefficient shows that the relationship between Tamil reading and Tamil spelling was strong and stable at every single time point. We actually expected weak relations between reading and spelling, but what we found was that Tamil reading and Tamil spelling were bi-directionally influential at an earlier time point over there. But, and this is actually similar to the Chinese language. And now for the Mal Malay language. And this is the co correlation coefficients for the Malay reading and spelling. And we can see from the correlation that it gets stronger over time. From the 
cross-leg coefficient, sorry, there's a lot of terms that I remember, there we see a bi-directional influence between reading and spelling at K1 to K2, while at K2 going on to P1, there is only a unidirectional influence of K2 spelling to K, uh, P1 reading. And now I actually pass on to Dr. O'Brien to give a summary and explanation of why we see this trend. Thank you. Okay, just to try to sum up quick, quickly, so all of those plots that you just saw, we summarized into a table so you don't have to draw every plot down. But basically what we see is the patterns across these languages um, was when we look at the correlations, so this is again within time correlations at each point, kindergarten one, kindergarten two, primary one, there is a significant relationship between these two sets of skills. So yes, reading and writing or reading and spelling are related to each other, but there's, they're not perfectly correlated, so they're independent skills as well. Um, secondly, what we saw was that the influence over time across development is that there was a stronger relationship between these skills early on in the kindergarten years, and then that got weaker when we get into early primary. And there were also differences in these early relationships, these cross-lag relationships across the languages. So for English and Chinese, there was a relatively stronger relation of reading, uh, influencing spelling, than vice versa. Whereas for Tamil and Malay, they were relatively bi-directional. There was an equal influence of each. Um, so what this tells us in conclusion is that overall, just from across the two research questions, just to review, metalinguistic skills um, are important for both English and mother tongue literacy. Um, and that vocabulary also contributes to the mother tongue literacy for our sample. Um, also, reading and spelling are related, but not completely uh, the same skills. We see some initial influence bi-directionally, and the strength of this influence is different across the languages. As I mentioned, it's stronger from reading to spelling for English and Chinese. Um, so what we wanted to do was to kind of put this into context of the theoretical models. And one theory that's been used to explain um, differences in reading processes across languages is the psycholinguistic grain size theory. Is anyone familiar with this? Okay, I was hoping I wasn't going to give you information you already knew. So if this is something new, I'll just explain it a little bit. So Ziegler and Goswami in 2005 came up with the, uh, the framework that um, languages code uh, oral language differently. So some languages like Malay or Tamil, you have these very consistent mappings between the letters and the sounds that they represent. So there's consistency in that. And for these languages, it's easier for the reader to access the letter to sound relationship. So these letter units are something that's relatively easier to learn and it uh, provides more information to the reader. Whereas when you have these less consistent languages, so English and Chinese are two examples, um, with Chinese being particularly not consistent because it's, it's not even alphabetic. Um, when you have this less consistent mappings, then that requires or, or provides information at larger units. So it's easier to access English, some would argue, and definitely Chinese at a syllable or a rhyme pattern level than it is at the letter level because the letter level is not as consistent. Um, so when we take this framework into mind, this helps us to think about some of the data that we were looking at with our children here in the, the kindergarten sample. And in particular, um, because they're bilingual learners, we also know that there may be interactions between the languages that they're learning. Um, so another theorist, uh, Lalier and Carreras, have developed the psycholinguistic grain size theory a little bit further for bilingual learners to say that um, you know, some learners who have the transparent or, or consistent languages can process at the letter level or what we refer to as the sublexical level whereas others who are reading these less consistent languages tend to process at what we would call the lexical or the word level. Um, and that when you're learning to read two of these languages, it depends on the language pair. So if you're learning a deeper language and a shallower language, um, a, a less consistent and a more consistent language, they suggest that you develop this kind of hybrid grain size at which you focus both reading in both languages. Um, so I'm gonna just end with some data. I, I, um, I don't know if I mentioned at the beginning, but you probably noticed our talk was all about typically developing learners, and this is a 
conference on dyslexia. <laughs> so I tried to throw in what little dyslexia data we have so far. We have an ongoing study, and this is actually with adults, uh, with university age uh, individuals. And these are um, young adults who are in the same three uh, language groups, same three bilingual groups. So we have Malay English, Tamil English, and Mandarin English speakers. And so some of these um, learners are learning one script or the others are learning two scripts. Um, and we're doing behavioral but also neuroimaging and neurostimulation uh, data collection with this group. Um, and I'll just present some of our initial findings. These are with a set of typically developing learners. So these are uh, Malay, Tamil, and Chinese English bilinguals in these three segments of bars. And what we did was we had them read different, we had them read aloud different English um, either words that were consistently decoded, irregular words, or um, pseudo words, non words. So, pseudo words here, the leftmost bar in each group, require this kind of sublexical processing. There's no lexical entry or meaning to a pseudo word or a non word, so you have to decode it. The um, irregular words, which is the bar to the right on each group, requires uh, lexical processing because they're hard to decode. I'm almost done. Um, and then what we see across these groups is that there's some relative differences here, particularly with the Tamil English group, in that their sublexical processing is better than their lexical level processing. And we expected that. Um, for the Chinese group, on the other hand, Chinese English group, we see that, and they're all, this is all processing English, so they're all looking at the exact same stimuli. Um, so when the Chinese English group is processing, uh, non-words or pseudo-words versus real words, they're uh, somewhat similar, so they're, they're better at both. Um, very preliminary data. We have uh, here, just within the Chinese English group, so these are the same data as over here, but we also have some atypical participants. So uh, these are participants who have a history of dyslexia, and I have to um, warn that there's only five in this group. We're desperately seeking for more participants. So if anyone has any ideas for where we can find adults with a history of dyslexia who know Chinese and English, please let me know. <laughs> um, but for these five participants, what we initially see with this data is that um, compared with the typical group, they're, they're okay with their, um, this is the irregular words, so lexical level processing looks similar, but they're a little bit worse off with sublexical processing, which fits with some of the models of dyslexia. And this is true for English, up here on the top, and also when we look at their Chinese reading, so we have either, uh, this is a lexical decision task, so we have either uh, non-word or non-characters and irregular characters. So when we look at their character reading, um, again, the, the dyslexic group is showing poor performance when they're having to use sublexical processing in this case. Okay, I'm sorry, I'll quickly wrap up. Um, so what, we, what our take home message is from all of this is that different types of uh, bilingual learners might approach reading differently depending on the languages that they're learning and we have to think of this when we're working with children or diagnosing children learning two languages. Um, and I think our, although our results are still in progress, uh, they do support some of the recommendations by uh, this book by Paradis, Genesi, and Crago. And they suggest that when you're diagnosing bilingual children for dyslexia or other disorders, that you should be examining reading skills in both of their languages and see if their first language is predictive of reading in their second language. Uh, they, would also they would also recommend that you assess the, learner, uh, sec uh, the learner's abilities in their second language at their proficiency level, not at their age level. So this might require you to actually make some assessments about their proficiency, either through vocabulary or another type of assessment. And finally, they uh, also suggest that another good, op uh, a good approach would be to use uh, the, the response to intervention approach with bilingual learners as well. Okay, so hopefully that gives you some uh, interesting things to take away. Uh, this is our my shameless plug for <laughs> looking for participants so we could get more um, people to take part in our dyslexia study. Um, so I have some flyers if anyone would like to take some or if you have suggestions, like I said, for where we can find people to recruit. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, these are our references and thank you for your attention. <laughs>